couple years ago, I took a spaghetti strainer, pot strainer, and turned it into a hobo stove. I called that video Super Size Hobo Stove, and that video has done very well for itself. In fact, I'll put a link to it at the end of this video if you haven't seen it yet. At the end of that video, I opened up to my viewers to provide comments on what they thought I should do to improve the design. Well, there was a lot of great comments, some of which I have considered seriously, one of which is what I'm going to share with you today. So if you're interested in how I have come up with a better version of the supersize hobo stove, keep watching. All right, before we begin, I just want to give credit to the viewer who inspired me to make this video. So I kind of have an, I'd had an idea in my mind of what I wanted to do, but it was Clint Carpenter who nailed it down for me. And so I want to give Clint the credit for this video because this is pretty much exactly what he had suggested. And uh, before I share that with you, let's just go back and take a quick look at the original design. So the original design was just basically one of these pots. This is the inside of a set of pots that you would use for cooking spaghetti or anything else that you wanted to strain simply by lifting it out of the water. All I had done to the original was to add conduit clamps to the bottom that would give it stability when they were turned out. Could be turned in for packing it up uh, and more neatly. But more importantly, it gave it a little bit of clearance off of the ground so some air could flow in through the bottom holes. So that was the basic design. And then I had a couple of different ways of suspending a pot over the top of it, one of which I brought with me. So if you recall that video, you can guess which one it is. It's the one that survived. Um, okay, so that was the original design. It had a couple of flaws in it. Uh, one major flaw, really, and that was too much airflow. Hard to believe, but with all those little holes, it amounted to a lot of airflow. Now, when the wind was not blowing, it, it created a good amount of airflow and a tremendous amount of heat. But as soon as the wind began to blow, it overfed the stove with air and oxygen. So I ended up with a tremendous amount of heat. That also means you go through your wood very fast. So part of my goal was to slow down the combustion sun, get some get it under control so that I didn't have to worry about it getting too hot, but you know, just control it some. And this is what Clint suggested. He said, normally when you buy these things at a kitchen supply place or wherever else like Walmart, this comes with this, which is a pot that you would put your water in. So I went back to Value Village, our local thrift store, and I looked around until I found a set that I thought I would like. It's bigger than I would have liked, but it was the first set that I came across where it came complete. In other words, it was a fitted top piece and bottom piece. I didn't have to try to match two separate pieces. After that, how simple is this? Measure and drill holes around the bottom. So there are 12 3 quarter inch drill holes uh, about, I think they're centered at one and a quarter inches off of the bottom. And that allows all the airflow that's going to come into the stove and then feed up the sides and through the bottom uh, to, you know, provide air to the wood. Now, when you put this together like this, does it remind you of anything? Well, it kind of reminded me of the Solo Campfire. I think that's the model closest in this. A wood gasification stove that is, it works, it's great. It's huge and it's expensive. And I looked at this and I said, you know, this would be really cool if this gasified like the Solo stove. So that's one of the things we're going to check today is I will load this up, preload it with wood and do a top down burn and we'll watch and see if there's any gasification taking place inside. Be honest, I, I don't think there will because I think the ratio of input air to secondary air is going to be too great. In other words, there's too much secondary air coming in from too many sides, too many places for it to really uh, create pyrolysis, which is essential for a true wood gas stove or gasification. However, I bet you we'll see some secondary uh, burning where air coming in through the jets around the side. So what's left to do? Let's get it loaded up and test it. All right, to get this uh, video going a little quicker, what I just to share with you what I've done is I preloaded the wood stove with some splits of mostly maple and some birch and a little bit of oak all found around the area here, all cut down and split. Took a few minutes to do that. Uh, you can probably see it is sitting on ice. It'll be interesting to see how much heat transfers down through this 
onto the ice and if it does any melting, but it is level and that's what's important to start with. Uh, I am going for a top-down burn with a horizontal load and not a vertical load. A couple of reasons. I'm trying to slow down the consumption of the wood. I find when it's vertically loaded, flames want to sink very quickly into the stack and you go through your wood much quicker that way. Uh, that's part of the reason. I only have it loaded to just about where the air holes around, or not air holes, actually drain holes, aren't they? But air holes, as far as we're concerned, are, so I could have put more wood in this, but uh, you really don't see secondary combustion and pyrolysis until it gets below that level where air can be re-entered into the mix. And uh, so I am, need to get a fire started on top of this. So you can see I have a bunch of little branches here, some birch bark, and another branch that I've snapped up. I'm going to put most of this in first because what am I going to use? Well, there were two th uh, comments generally from that original video. One, everybody laughed at me, rightfully so, that I used a cake pan, not what they call it, a cake thing that you lay on the counter to put your cakes on uh, uh, to support them. And I put that on the original stove and of course it just melted and sank in. I almost lost my water into my fire. That's what I did in the first one. So then I brought this out, which is a grill which is large enough to span the whole surface. And uh, I showed as an alternative a trivet that I picked up at Value Village. And the trivet fits in a couple of different ways. I'm going to fit it in like this today. It doesn't fit in quite as well as it did in that original hobo stove, but it fits in well enough. Now, that is solid. As long as the heat doesn't damage it any, I've got all kinds of room for air to come up around it. I've got room to feed sticks in once I get to the point where I need to add fuel. And it's going to be a good strong support for a pot. Now this pot looks tiny in comparison to the size of the stove. And I could have brought out the original pot. By the way, this is 13 centimeters in diameter, so it's not a small pot, but it is a good size pot. I have this pot here specifically. I might as well share that with you now. At the same time I'm recording the video for this stove, I'm recording another video on a pizza that I'm making out here in the woods. So if you're interested, watch for that. I don't know which one will come out first, but watch for pizza in the woods. I'll be using this stove and this pot and a number of other implements to make that lunch with and everything will have come from the thrift store which is part of what I wanted to accomplish today. All right, let's get some birch bark in here. This is some rough dead birch bark. It's not the nice fluffy stuff that you get off the side of a tree. This is off of a dead log on the ground. Some of it is damp but it should still ignite. Yeah, save this one little piece for my igniting. Get my lighter out, which is this SOL Survive Outdoor Longer Plasma Lighter. Ooh, when that doesn't light up right, oh, there we go. I was gonna say, when that doesn't light up right away, it tells you just how old the birch bark is, come on. Birch bark is wonderful stuff, but it's not all equal. If it's old, it'll still burn. It just takes a little longer sometimes to get going. Probably should have looked for a little bit of the better stuff to go with this. I think I'll wait and get some more of that birch bark caught before I add my little kindlings. I gotta get this done quickly enough so I can get that pot support, trivet pot support on without burning myself. Am I gonna be able to do this? Not easily. All right, I think that'll work, once, especially once that starts to burn down. Now, the whole concept behind a wood gas stove is that you load your fuel first, put a small fire on top of that, and as that fire starts to gain momentum, hot coals will sink down into the loaded fuel and uh, catch it on fire. 
And as it gets to the level where the secondary ports are, that's when pyrolysis normally would occur. Kind of not too sure it's going to work today, but that's all part of the fun, isn't it? To see what happens. So let's give this a minute or two to see how well it gets going. And we'll just follow its progress as we do. I can say right off the top that there is plenty of airflow. So, oh, while this is catching on, we can talk a little bit about the construction. So I didn't spend any time on that because this is so simple. Once you have marked your spots where you want these holes to go in the outside pot, uh, you're going to need some way of drilling them. To drill them, uh, I start with a just a little dimple made with a punch just to give a point for the drill to, to catch on and not skate all over the metal. I got a little pilot hole created with a carbide tip drill and then I enlarged the holes with a step drill. And I'll put a picture on the step of a step drill on the screen right now. If you're familiar with them, they, then you'll know how they operate. And I decided to go with three quarter inch diameter intake holes. I could have gone larger, but uh, I felt if I started with the smaller diameter holes, then I could always move up in size. And of course I can't go backwards there. That's gonna sit in there nicely, perfect. Here's something I hadn't anticipated. There's paint on the trivet itself that's catching on fire. That's kind of kind of cool. But you can see I'm able to feed sticks in right now from a number of different angles. You still have to get that, take some time to get this initial fire going. Birch bark and spruce twigs. Marvelous stuff to get fires going though. I'm not convinced the trivet is the best way. I mean, it's it's convenient the way it works and allows me to get sticks in and gives me a little height. But the thing with the trivet is I'm not sure how well it's constructed in terms of the welds where everything crosses over. Well, that's what we're looking to see, isn't it? I'm going to wait before I put my pot of water on until the main fuel load is uh, is starting to burn just so I can uh, give you a better look at what's taking place inside. So why don't I just cut away for a few minutes, let this continue to uh, ramp up and get down into the main fuel load and we'll see how it's turning out. All right, it's been about oh, four or five minutes since I turned the camera off and you can see how well the fire is going. I think my water is just about to a boil. Well, that's ice water out of a stream and it's steaming anyway. I'm not too convinced that the trivet was a great idea. I've got to keep an eye on it so it doesn't collapse into it. But I want you to look down the inside of the firebox, or the pot itself. You can see air being drawn in through the holes all the way around the outside. So you are seeing some secondary combustion, but it's not pyrolysis. It's not true gasification. It's, uh, yeah, it's just not. That's not what is occurring down there just the same. It's a much more controlled fire than I had when I used the other version of this hobo stove. It's actually working very, very well. All right, I've got to change positions because as I said, I'm not convinced that that uh, trivet is gonna hold on much longer. All right, first test of version two of the Supersize Hobo Stove. Was it a success? Yes, yes it was with one qualification. So it met almost all the objectives I had for it when I brought it out for testing today, with the exception of it didn't gasify, it didn't create pyrolysis, it's not a wood gas stove. To be honest, I didn't think it would. I recognized that the ratio of air coming in from the bottom and air coming into the fire chamber was off and it wasn't gonna work out the way it would for true pyrolysis. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean it wasn't a clean burning stove. In fact, once it got started, it was virtually smoke free. It may not be a solo campfire, but it still works pretty darn good. You know, even a solo stove usually smokes when you get it started. They don't really become smoke free 
until they reach peak efficiency. So that's just something to be aware of. This is not a solo stove, but it still worked out very well. So what, else, what were the objectives that I set out for it that I wanted to see? Well, the setting the burn chamber down inside of the pot and allowing air to be fed from the bottom avoided the problem that I had with the first stove with losing heat out of the side through convection and breezes and wind. All of the heat generated by the wood was forced straight up to whatever pot or pan I had on top of the stove. So that was basically, that was the overall objective. That was my number one objective that I set out to achieve and it worked perfectly. Now, maybe a little bit too much heat, too much airflow coming in. Um, I'm going to talk about how I might be able to occlude some of that airflow and slow the burn down. The burn was hot, the burn was fast. Part of that was my fault. I contributed to it by cutting the wood too small. I had cut the wood to the size I would use in many other of my wood stoves and this could tolerate, would actually benefit from having bigger chunks of wood dropped into it, much bigger chunks of wood, because they would take longer to consume, they wouldn't get as hot, and they would last longer, of course, and you'd get some more moderated heat. So that's a lesson, if you're going to try this, is to use bigger wood. You need small wood to get it going, but once it is, you can, you can easily use bigger wood and be very successful with it. Um, yeah, so a couple of thoughts here. This is the trivet that I had on top. For a while, I thought this was going to fail. It was turning white as the paint burnt off of it, and I was pretty sure the heat was going to be intense enough to break the welds all the way around. It's worked out just fine. It's all put together. Nothing came loose. It's ready. I can use it again. It's still a viable option. Not sure that I will, though, and the reason being, it does work to bring the height of your pot stand above the stove, which is great, if you're using a very large pot, that's my, where I see the advantage. Something like a 12-quart Dutch oven, if I was going to use something that large, something that was as large, maybe a large fry pan, something that was the same diameter or larger than the stove itself, then raising it above the level of the stove would be important. Makes it easy to feed wood in. The size of the pots that I was using didn't require that, so what I found is I switched over to use in this grill and this worked out much better for a couple of reasons. It brought my pot and pan down closer to the fire so I wasn't losing any heat from convection across the top but it was also I could lift this off very easily, toss some more weight in, put it down, put my pots back on. In fact I could probably, I guess, I could have set it off to the side and fed wood in without even taking this off. It would have worked out fine. Either would be good. Okay, version 2 Super Sive Hobo Stove. It's worked out very well for me. I will tell you, a lot of heat did transfer down through the bottom of this stove into the earth below. I have about a hole an inch deep in the ice that I had set this on. No problem here in the winter time, but had this been the summer and I've been on a combustible surface, I don't know if it would have caused a problem, but it's something to be aware of. Put a couple rocks under it, put a trivet under it, put something underneath it to lift it off of the surface so that you don't transfer so much heat down into the ground below you. Uh, that's just another lesson learned. Okay, I said I had a few ideas. I still have suggestions left over from the last video, which I may use on this yet. But what I think I'll do is I'll open it up to you. What are your thoughts? What are your observations? Was this first test of version two of the supersized hobo stove a success? Is it worth pursuing? Do you have suggestions for improving the design and should I continue following through on this and bring it back yet again as a future version 3 maybe? All right, if you have suggestions or comments, please put them in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.